some sort of a, a recommendation. So uh, when you look at the, the whole topic about uh, loss and damage, we want to trace it back to the, the, the sixth assessment report in 2021, where we are talking about uh, the IPPC sixth assessment showed a scenario where the global surface temperature are likely to increase until at least uh, mid-century under the emission scenario that is uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees. And this is actually because of, we are talking about the human-induced climate change, which uh, is likely to still continue increasing when we do the business as usual scenario. But the other thing that you have to appreciate is that uh, these climate changes are human-induced and uh, it's already affecting uh, many of these weather and climate extremes are already affecting some of the poor people in the world and evidence of uh, observed changes in extreme um, uh, observed changes are including this extreme heat heavy precipitation drought and uh, tropical cyclones they are all attributing to what was there before the fifth assessment report so it really calls for the need to really look at uh, who is getting more and more affected and we say severe climate change impacts are already happening and are the vulnerable communities marginalized uh, both socially and economically are getting more and more exposed to climate change because they have the fewest uh, resources to adapt or even to mitigate uh, climate change and if you look at it uh, from now the justice lens then we say the impact of climate justice they are also uh, they are distributed unevenly you know the 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 poor who are the most affected, they contribute the least to anthropogenic climate change, which, and uh, at the same time, when we are talking about a likely scenario of uh, increased climate change, they're the ones that are going to be affected even more. And this now underscores the importance of approaching adaptation, mitigation, and uh, loss and damage as a justice issue. And to address uh, climate change and uh, associated impact, the global community that was in 2015, there was the issue of uh, Paris Agreement and also the continued promotion of uh, what was agreed upon in 2002 for mitigation and uh, some of the adaptation actions. And uh, this now gave a lot of impetus to the, uh, to the concept of uh, climate justice when talking, uh, taking action to addressing climate change. So when you look at uh, the discussion then at the Paris Agreement, there was a lot, an entire uh, chapter seven, uh, the, the article seven basically del delved into this issue of addressing adaptation because of the feeling that there is a group that we continually are going to be affected more and more because they're losing productive assets, they're losing uh, livelihoods, they're losing incomes and uh, they're losing health and even human dignity. And we are going to see this as we continue with the presentation. So the, the Paris Agreement uh, provided a cooperation and a facilitation uh, sort of a platform for us to understand the events that uh, this that involve more irreversible and uh, permanent damages and also non-economic losses uh, due to climate change. So there was a framework to uh, comprehensively look at this. And uh, this is where now the issue of loss and damage somehow started uh, gaining some traction. And when you look at now uh, climate justice, we just don't look at it as a, as it's cutting across and uh, like uh, as something that uh, globally is matching the same. We're saying climate justice, we have uh, to look at it in uh, different ways by using three, uh, three principles. And one of it is a distributive justice, you know, the common but differentiated responsibility. And, uh, the way nations and uh, regions are also affected differently. We also look at it from the procedural justice and there's the whole recognition that there are people who are increasingly being affected and they are getting worse by climate change. So particularly within the arid and semi-arid, and if you consider uh, arid, semi-arid lands, uh, particularly I'll, be, I'll begin about uh, Africa, the belt that runs from Cape Verde all the way to Somali, that's, um, there's a very big region here that is considered ASAL, and that is the Sahel Belt, the Great Horn of Africa. That uh, and in this particular region, again, you find the most vulnerable. It's the most vulnerable region in terms of climate change, and we have the most vulnerable uh, population because of the, 
their livelihoods and uh, what they engage in. Further, the adaptation report, the adaptation gap report for 2020 to delve into the issue of uh, talking about failures in terms of addressing climate change, which is increasingly putting the world at risk. And uh, adaptation actions remain largely, uh, we look at them as incremental in nature, but not addressing future risk. And this, is, this causes the problem, the twin strategy of uh, you are increasing, reinforcing existing vulnerability because of the power structures and um, the socioeconomic uh, settings of these communities. But we are also increasingly introducing new forms of vulnerability. And uh, this really affects this particular population. So vulnerable communities in ASALs, you know, they are shaped by issues of uh, social status, exclusion from uh, government services, uh, the issue of uh, the disruption in the food system and uh, biased market forces, which pushes them further into high levels of poverty and low purchasing power. And uh, increasingly, again, when we talk of adaptation deficit, these are the regions that are getting more and more affected uh, in higher order. And uh, the adaptation deficits really show uh, points highly in these particular areas. So apart from the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, uh, Kenya is one of the countries that falls squarely in these places where we can describe as arid and semi-arid, with nearly 80% of land mass uh, being described as arid and semi-arid. And this is a home to nearly 30% of the Kenyan population, which is approximately around 49 million. Uh, the total population is 49 million. So uh, do the math, 30% uh, of that population are at this particular risk that we are mentioning. But importantly, this particular area holds about 70% of the parks, uh, national uh, park, but there are also important grazing areas for the livestock uh, in this country. So the parks on one side support tourism, but also support uh, in that particular rangeland ecosystem, it's important for the grazing of livestock. And uh, if you look at uh, the last decade, the government has adopted a national policy framework on uh, semi-arid, but they still need to effectively tackle climate change. That's why we were looking at how do we unearth uh, gaps in the climate change adaptation, loss of damage, and uh, just avert this, uh, because there's a lot of reliance on a humanitarian system to come in during the, the critical uh, years, like the last four, five years, uh, this particular area, um, the most part of this, uh, the very, the arid part of the country has not received rainfall. So it's really getting, the situation is uh, worsening day by day. And uh, it, it forms the basis for us to do this scoping study. So if I can uh, just tell you the, the background. So the scoping study was just to find out more about uh, how people describe climate change in this particular area in relation to justice, in relation to the suffering of uh, this particular population and uh, look for ways of advocating for green economy and uh, pushing civil society to take action and even governments to lead to um, transformation. So as we go to now looking at uh, that particular area that I'm saying, the arid, so if you look at this map, the brown part of, the, the, of this map of Kenya, this is now the arid, semi-arid counties. And further, if you look at the map on my, the, the, the one on, your, on my right, now you see, you'll appreciate like Turkana, uh, Samburu, Marsabit, Isiolo, Wajia. Uh, it's a better part of this country, Tana River. This is now the very arid now area, which has not received rainfall for the last four, five years. And then now um, the one that has uh, the vertical line. So this is where we have the, the semi-arid. So it's a slightly of a mix but they are slightly better off, but there are some places that are now moving towards aridity because of uh, the continued uh, climate uh, change. So uh, for methodology, we used uh, desk review and we looked at, uh, we only, we picked four counties. Uh, that was, uh, if you can see, I'm moving around. So they, we picked Samburu, we picked uh, this county of Taitataveta down here at the coast. We scooped around uh, Kajiado, and we also moved uh, here around, uh, somewhere around Mount Kenya here, they, this county here, uh, Laikipia. And the reason why we picked those counties is because uh, like for some of, uh, for Laikipia, it's semi-arid, 
but there's a lot of now movement of livestock from, uh, sorry. So you see where Laikipia is uh, here being semi-arid or somewhere here. So there's a lot of livestock movement from Turkana, Baringo, West Pokot, all the way towards Laikipia so that they can graze around the Mount Kenya ecosystem. There are also a livestock moving from Samburu and occasionally you'll have uh, even up to Marsabit moving all the way down. So that was the justification. And then when you looked at uh, when you look at the position of Kajiado, it's uh, towards down, but Kajiado is also host to a park. And there have been other other projects that have been done around um, national park, the ecosystem uh, management. So we were trying to look at how far are they in terms of uh, adaptation and mitigation with those kind of intervention. Then when you move towards the coast, you know the coast region people talk more tight at Aveta. Uh, is classified under the coastal region. But the, the emphasis when it comes to adaptation and mitigation, we talk about building wall, the, the, the walls, uh, the, 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 the walls to protect that uh, coastal ecosystem uh, from, uh, from, from uh, the rising water levels. But just slightly inside, then you're having this particular area and uh, these counties at the coast, like Kuala, Kilifi, Lamu, which are semi-arid, so Taita Tabdeveta was a good representation for that particular area. So um, our methodology, we did uh, some desk reviews, uh, focusing on the four counties that I've mentioned, uh, Kajiado, Samburu, Taita Tabdeveta, and Laikipia. And we're looking at the projects that have been done by different entities in terms of adaptation, mitigation, loss, and damage, just to, uh, to appreciate the journey so far, but to also look at uh, where the gaps are. But in such, uh, again, for this adaptation, uh, the climate justice strategies, we reviewed over a hundred um, uh, hundred documents on adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage. And we are looking at different websites and what people say they're doing both globally, nationally in these particular areas and um, locally on climate uh, change adaptation. And then we also appreciated uh, from the repositories, uh, JSTOR, Google Scholar, what, what really people are talking about in terms of programs, projects, and interventions in this particular county. So we narrowed down just to enrich our focus. So we also conducted uh, target stakeholder meetings, and further we did a focus group discussion in these particular areas. And um, for the policy space, uh, nationally, when you are talking about uh, adapt, uh, gl globally, when talking about adaptation, mitigation, loss, and damage, what comes into mind, one is the, currently the Paris Agreement, as it is, was robust in terms of uh, uh, aim, aiming to strengthen the global response to the threats of climate change, particularly on adaptation and mitigation. We also looked at the Sendai framework for disaster risk management, because some of these counties, they heavily benefit from uh, strategies on disaster risk management. So we wanted to see the link between what is being done from the disaster side and uh, how now treating adaptation, uh, the, the extremes of uh, weather, droughts, droughts and uh, floods and uh, the, other, the other happenings that happen in this particular area, how they're being treated within that space. So we went for the Sendai frame, framework. The SDG goals, particularly goal number six, uh, six uh, the one on water was really an issue. You know, most of these projects will tell you uh, some of the strategies were addressing other issues like uh, diversification, like income generating, but a lot of emphasis from this community, if, if there's one message that I would like you to go home with, is that, that SDG six, all of them point to one thing, all that they need to effectively adapt, to effectively mitigate climate change, to effectively respond to loss and damage is nothing other than water. So water uh, continues to be and uh, will continue to be the lifeline in these communities. Because they said, even if you are to do mitigation, like uh, raise tree seedlings and raise nurseries and uh, plant trees and ensure the survival of these trees for mitigation, we need water. So. If you are to water animals, because you'll see even the kind of number of hours they walk to watering point. So water is really appreciated as a critical in this uh, adaptation, uh, adaptation, mitigation, and loss and damage uh, issues around Assad. 
to that's why the sustainable development goal is but i'm appreciating also climate action and others but uh key point that i want you to look at uh, with a keen lens is uh, the issue of water so within our national frameworks we have the vision 2030 which is to uh, aimed at uh, having Kenya be a middle income economy by 2030. And also there are different pillars. So one of the pillars was uh, the social pillar for the welfare, the well-being of the community. But within the vision 2030, there's the provision uh, to ensure that uh, the environment, the ecosystem is taken care of, and that the, the, there's the livelihood of the uh, different communities are protected. So we have the Kenya National Climate Change Response Strategy that looks at and mitigation, especially within the arid and semi-arid. This is being updated right now. So um, we appreciate the effort that is going towards that. So then there's the National Adaptation Plan that actually centered again at the issues of adaptation, particularly within the arid and semi-arid lands. The Kenya National, uh, the NDC, we report uh, on adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation, but we are looking, uh, the, the NDC in the country was looking towards uh, addressing again uh, the issues we are talking about here. So the Cl Kenya Climate uh, Smart Agriculture Strategy still points to water, uh, still points to the issue of uh, livelihood, particularly in the arid and semi-arid, and also the mitigation measures. So then we are having Kenya develop further the Kenya Climate uh, Fund regulations and uh, there's a funding that, uh, that uh, Kenya is now putting so as to support issues of uh, adaptation, mitigation, and uh, loss and damage, which needs to be appreciated. So when you look at this particular counties, there is the issue of the guidelines. So like Kipia, Kajiado, Samuta, Itataveta, there are already policies, plans, uh, regulations on, in terms of adaptation and mitigation. And... Um, there are those counties that have developed uh, acts. There are those that have, have policies, and this they are developing for to benefit from funding such as uh, we are talking about uh, the FLOCA, uh, the financing locally led adaptation, and also to attract investments in different uh, adaptation mechanism. So again, the one that needs further highlighting when you look, uh, no, because we have uh, kind of tried to domesticate the Warsaw International Framework, is appreciate its importance in terms of assessing the risk related to loss and damage and identify different options and designs for implementing a locally driven uh, strategy. So the Warsaw framework provides a really comprehensive framework for climate risk management and uh, promoting uh, environment and also inviting different players to adaptation. So this is really, really important. So then, when we move, we look at the issue about uh, discussion on, uh, on findings. So for our study, if you look at this uh, chart, so there's a lot of livestock death and there was also locust invasion. So this particular area, assets, we, we'll, we'll talk of adaptation, we'll talk of mitigation, loss and damage, and we think it's only because of climate change, but the situation gets worse and because they suffer triple tragedy. So, in this particular year, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2021, 2019, those locust invasion, which cleared even vegetation. So when we go to 2022, now livestock death was occurring. Because Hi, Molo. I believe uh, Molo is having some connection issues. Let's uh, give, him, give him a minute as we wait for him to resume with the presentation. Sorry, my apologies. 
I was using my laptop, but I'm somewhere where the electricity connection is slightly controlled. So I'll, I'll use my phone, but I, I promise I'll share the slides. Is that okay, Emily? That is in order. Thank you. So uh, I was just describing uh, at the point where, when you're looking at the, the loss and damage. So one of it now is between the year uh, 2020 and 2022, in this particular region, uh, the arid, especially in uh, Samburu and Laikipia, there was, uh, apart from the livestock dying because of uh, the extensive extreme drought, they also faced, uh, the, there was a competition because there was locust inversion in that particular area. So with the locust inversion, then something unique happened that uh, most of the vegetation was uh, the locust, you know, it's swarms of locusts that clear almost everything. They eat to brown, you know. Once, uh, when, if they land in a green space, it takes them just one, one day and everything is gone. So that was another problem that this particular area suffered. And then if you uh, you consider again those that particular year to be, uh, that particular period 2020 2022 Taita Taveta suffered extreme uh, there was extreme flooding it was a period of rainfall short one but it flooded the entire uh, entire area and uh, the animals that survived drought got swept away by uh, floods and it happened in uh, Kajiado a short period of uh, flood and it swept away animals. So that's why we are saying that when you are looking at loss and damage here, and uh, you are thinking about just um, adaptation and mitigation, there is more because uh, the tragedies that befall this particular area. One tragedy uh, often get uh, you get before you are finally fully address it, you get to another and another tragedy almost uh, repeatedly. So the, the circle of drought is surely followed by floods almost immediately. And this really compounds the problem of um, the problem of drought in this particular area. It makes it even impossible for these communities because what was remaining after the first uh, the first extreme of uh, climate change that is like uh, extreme weather uh, because of high heat and drought, it's now lost through flooding. So apart from that, the other thing that uh, happen is uh, during, because now most of uh, these families are without the, their productivity, the, the most productive asset that is livestock. And that is one of the most economic, uh, it's an economic activity that can effectively happen in this particular area. So the other thing that is happening within this particular area is uh, some of the elders uh, reported that because of floods, they feel they're not human enough, they are, a man without a cow in this particular area really feels like he's left naked, you know, the human dignity is not, not there. And um, uh, the, uh, the other thing that happens, there's uh, a number of livestock diseases that was also reported during this period, East Coast fever and uh, being one of them. So East Coast fever was because of the extreme heat uh, and uh, the lots of livestock moving into one particular region. So this help this somehow leads to a lot of disease transmission, which now again wipes out uh, livestock in this area. So apart from the livestock disease, the children who are going to school are dropping out of school because of uh, one thing, there's no food at home. So no food at home, they have to engage, some of them are now engaging in, uh, in charcoal burning, uh, especially for the parents. Some of the children now are just in, uh, within the towns uh, loitering and trying to uh, fend for food through begging, you know, and that is now going to be a, a long term economic uh, and a social problem when children don't go to school. So this particular area is the suffering this time around was really extreme and uh, it's beyond the, the when we say the adaptation uh, report, the, the adaptation report for 2022, the adaptation gap. Uh, pointed to worsening situation really. This particular counties, the four counties gave us that uh, scenario of a worsening situation. The, the distances they're now walking, it's average seven to eight hours in some areas like Samburu to get water, you know, uh, to fetch, uh, to fend water for animals. So the walking distances are even longer. 
initially they would walk two to three hours, but now they are walking six, they are average four, five, six hours to get to water points. So this is really extreme and it's a uh, human suffering in a bigger way. So what, what, what do we make of this? You know, adaptation is not, adaptation mitigation loss and damage are now just are beyond just climate, but they are now moving to issues of health. They, they are moving to social setup. So many other places that we didn't, uh, we didn't think initially that they're affecting. So when we talk of the loss and damage, uh, the social, there's the social damages, uh, the social uh, losses or the, the social losses because of uh, climate change, then we are thinking of um, these men who say they now don't feel as men enough in their families. They have nothing to do. They have no contribution. And uh, a place like Samburu, they are, they are, they was, it was recommended that some of those men need to go for uh, psycho, psycho, uh, psychological counseling and trauma. Imagine waking up, live, uh, and you see 300, 400 of your cattle go to graze, but after one, one, one month, you are having around 100, another month, you've lost another 100. So by the end of that, the, the, the drought period when you left your livestock to go graze in the forest, they are coming, what they are coming back with is either that bell that was on around the neck of the animal or, uh, or some uh, some some sort of uh, if you had a tag on the nose, somebody brings you that tag and tells you this is your stock, you know. So the men really feel disenfranchised. So we always think climate change affects women more, but men are now increasingly also reporting in this pastoral community among the pastoralists that they are get they are also suffering the impacts of climate change. I won't uh, underscore how the suffering of the children because it's even uh, extreme dropping out of school, the incident is where children were dropping out, uh, dropping down in assemblies and there's one who died because of uh, this year, because of uh, the whole drought and climate change. So really, when we talk uh, loss and damage, when you talk adaptation, we are talking directly to what the people uh, in these particular areas are feeling. So beyond just the talk, there's already some action happening. And uh, how does this happen? So one of the ways is through the nature-based solution. So among the pastoralists, there's already diversification of livelihood through beekeeping. Uh, some of them are trying to tree seedlings. They are also restoring ecosystem like uh, Kirisia Forest. Once it was gazetted to be a natural forest, now the community took leadership in terms of uh, its restoration and management. There are also plants uh, and uh, they are trying to do some small, in small ways, uh, rehabilitating some of the degraded land. Again, as a country, the, the Kenya is trying to, uh, Kenya is preparing these counties to benefit from Flocka, that is financing locally led adaptation. And Laikipia County had already passed the, I can say they had passed the test, so they are, they've been given the nod that they are going to benefit from uh, this uh, financing for locally led adaptation. Uh, Taita Taveta, there's some efforts in terms of conservation uh, agriculture and uh, agroforestry. For Kajiado and uh, Samburu, some of these uh, pastoralists who have been affected, they are, they've moved into growing hay, they've been uh, actively purchasing hay, but also, you know, what, what they, they've discovered among this pastoral group, uh, the pastoralist groups, is that large livestock tend to be affected more by climate change. So what they are doing as a people is they're moving, they're reconfiguring their herds from the big stocks, uh, that is uh, cattle, and they're moving to the short uh, sheep and goat. But there are others uh, like in Samburu who are now moving into camel. So camel, sheep and goat are now uh, they are going to define the future of adaptation in that particular area. But there are also efforts to mitigation that, uh, uh, as we've mentioned, tree seedlings. But how do you do tree seedlings? So the question they asked us was this, how can I do tree seedlings if I don't have water? How do I water the tree seedling? So we was taken through areas, and uh, I've shown that, where tree seedlings were done, but they dried up. So we, as we talk adaptation, as we talk uh, mitigation, we have to appreciate that that is happening. So 
as we come to a conclusion of this, then what else, what, what do we make of this or what can we say of this? The one, still um, in terms of adaptation, financing will be necessary. And uh, there's still a robust need to finance adaptation. But the question will be, what are we going to finance in adaptation? So that is what we need to get right so that we stop uh, financing anything and everything in the name of adaptation. Secondly, uh, the other thing that uh, will be important is a framework for loss and damage uh, has not been uh, developed for the country in terms of when we ask them, for instance, who's lost uh, cattle and who's lost livestock, who's lost sheep. So they said, yes, we've lost them. But when you ask for the numbers or when they, they were seeing this happening, there's no particular like documentation and uh, talking into this. So we might be forced somehow to start thinking of uh, either use of technology to document this loss and damage and uh, to see even if it's about compensation, how do we compensate for loss and damage? We also have uh, the existing schemes like uh, the first schemes, the payment for ecosystem services that have been in, involved in this particular areas. But what is happening is uh, for this pay payment for ecosystem services, we are seeing some sort of a conflict between those who are keen in terms of uh, carbon schemes, shielding or uh, kind of fencing areas that these uh, communities would pass to go graze. So there's some sort of a subtle conflict developing between now uh, on one side conservation uh, uh, imperatives and on the other side of the adaptation imperative. So, how do we resolve this kind of uh, conflict? And it, policy wise, we still need to look for strategy policies uh, locally because some of the counties had developed strategies, others were not, uh, hadn't developed uh, strategies. Others had plans uh, in terms of adaptation, loss and damage and mitigation, others did not. So having a plan and the strategies for this particular community will really be important. So, I want to stop at this stage so that we can also have a time to just uh, uh, have a discussion on the same. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Molo, for the nice presentation. It's really an incredible uh, work and it's good to know what's happening through uh, such a, a research projects. Uh, I'll uh, share a summary of what I've gotten from this presentation, after which I'll open the floor to anyone with a question or remarks or something to add on top of what Molo has presented. Uh, uh, I've gotten that the global surface temperature will continue to increase, uh, which is mainly attributed to human-induced climate change. And the third bit is that the poor who are the poor will be the most affected in as much as they least contribute to anthropogenic change and that's the need for or to reinforce adaptation options in the country. Uh, also the fact that 89% uh, of the land mass in Kenya is described as a sal, arid and semi-arid and home to nearly 30% of the Kenya population and 70% of the livestock in Kenya are distributed around these asal regions and that it is also home to most of the wild animals in the country, uh, uh, um, a resource that contributes to tourist uh, attraction in the country. And so the need, the, we emphasize that much should be taken to address these issues before the problem escalates. And also the fact that as a country, as Africa, we don't need to over rely on humanitarian aid during the crisis, which is not a sustainable approach to climate adaptation. The third bit to this is the fact that the students we have in the country are dropping out of school because of hunger. They are forced to drop out of school to look for food. And this is something that is really not good and which uh, clearly shows that we need to put a lot of effort towards adaptation measures to make sure that such issues that are, are attributed to climate change are addressed in the country. Uh, with, no, with those few remarks, I'd like to open the floor to anyone with a question or a remark, you can chat, you can type in your questions in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly to Mr. Molo uh, Karibu. Hello. Hello. Caroline. Hi. Yes, this is Caroline. I really enjoyed this uh, 
presentations, even including the last week one. And I uh, really thank you, Arun, for making it possible that we can actually uh, listen to these nice, interesting presentations because they make us even understand what is ongoing. And I think we become even better scholars. I don't know if my, I don't know, Molo, you will, uh, you will are we talking about climate change adaptation and mitigation. I think this is a story that has been said day in, day out. And actually, as you put it clearly towards the end of your presentation, we talking about climate change financing, a very, very important component in mitigating and adapting to climate change. But my question, just like, the, just like last week is, how well are our people involved in these processes? How well are people, our people involved in these processes? Because I listened, I, sorry, I got in a bit late, but I think I got you somewhere where, where I think I can make my substantive contribution. You know, when we are talking about this pastoralist and so on and so forth, and the FLOCA, you know, financing the locally led adaptation strategies, how well are our people? How well are they part of the stakeholders? Because for you, for, for us to be able to do anything, and I think Dr. Atela last week was, we, we really have to really go the social way. Because when we have a lot of science, a lot of findings, and many other things that our people are not part of, then it becomes so difficult to own. You know, you don't come to tell me that this is what I think we need to be doing. And I was not part of the preparation of that, uh, of that uh, particular uh, item or issue. So I think the, 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 the problem that we are having as scholars, I think we are doing so much without involving the people at hand. And I really like the fact that you are pu putting in the issue of gender. Gender is also another aspect that really has to do with this climate change adaptation and even mitigation. Well, I didn't know about the men suffering, but I'm glad today I learned that the men are suffering even more on issues of climate change adaptation and they really feel it. So how, how, well, how well are we engendering issues of climate change and even in climate change adaptation and climate change financing? How well are the ideas put in place so that we can be able to go a long way? Because without this, actually, we are just having an excess in futility. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for the question. Uh, Molo, kindly respond to that as we wait for other questions that might be presented here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, uh, for the active participation and also for these uh, insightful questions. You know, one of the things that uh, happened uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, FLOCA, the financing locally led adaptation, uh, one of the things that is discussed is uh, most of these adaptation strategies fail because of the approach. Uh, there's the issue of the, the power interplay where we somehow maintain the existing structures that uh, led to first these vulnerabilities, but we pretend to be working for the, lo uh, for the local people. So one of the things that is happening is uh, with Floca, there's, the, 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 there's some attempt in terms of appreciating that if we continue with doing adaptation the usual way where it is about where we, we plan it as scholars, we plan it as a government, we plan it as county, but we forget that the local people, the bottom line is it's deemed to fail and it's not going to benefit the people. So with Floca, then there's the issue about integrating seven, eight, eight, there are eight principles of locally led adaptation into the program, where it's the local community to come up and say, this is what we are looking for. This is what we are aiming for. And you know, like for this particular study, when we were doing it, we somehow for the key informant, we didn't give it uh, that big chunk. We were talking to the local communities and they were telling us there what really is happening and why it's important that uh, we address adaptation and why it's important that we include, we actively have, must have uh, the local community at the center of this uh, debate. Then the secondly, when you look at the issue of uh, engendering now climate change, there, is the, there was a whole discussion that came up and they said that even some of these men now, you people, we've talked to girl child, we've talked to women, 
but men now finding it even more uh, difficult. And that's now appreciating the gender, uh, looking at climate change in terms of the, giving it a gender lens and uh, the, the roles that societies are forced to men and women. You know, men have been given this thing of uh, either decision-making or they are the owners of this asset, but they not, now no, don't have assets. So what is their role in the community? Yeah. So, and that's why now you see there's this active participation of these, even these men, and they're now willing to speak out and say, really, we are suffering. Initially, probably they were comfortable, so they were not even ready to take part in this kind of debate, so uh, to give their opinion on some of these issues. So uh, that is why, like we're saying, we need to do more in terms of uh, bringing in the local uh the local, uh, the, the local person, the local community, and not just saying that they are at the center, while it's me, it's Emily, it's uh, Caroline, who are at the center, the elite capture. But we want a situation where when we are addressing climate change, then it's the lo it's whole hog, the local community plan, the local community, uh, some uh, plan, it's the local community that make decisions. You know what happens at times again with uh, some of the adaptation and mitigation projects, local communities come in probably at the implementation stage. So they come in as beneficiary and we assume they are passive. But now the good thing about FLOCA is if the part of the principle is local community must take part in the planning, in the designing of projects, in kind of prioritizing projects for adaptation. So this is really, really uh, important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Molo, for addressing that question uh, promptly. I can't see to see any hand raised or uh, questions in the chat box. Oh, okay. I can see Kim, Kim Sung Q. Kindly unmute and answer your question. Ah, ask yes. your question. Thank you very much. I'm Song Kyu Kim, a uh, lecturer here from the University of Sussex from, uh, in England. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I'm really fascinated by this topic. And thank you very much, Molo. I'm, just one thing I want to clarify. I mean, the loss and damage mechanism is still very much debated. I don't think it hasn't been any announcement of uh, finances that's going to be made available for countries, especially like in Kenya. I don't know if that's the case yet. If you already have the finances secure for this as a loss and damage um, uh, part of the, um, the uh, funding mechanisms, that's one thing. Um, second thing I was really very uh, fascinating to hear about was the uh, some of the things that the local uh, community members, pastoralists are what they're already doing to, to, to try to adapt uh, in this uh, tragedic, uh, tra tragedies. So I think there's a two things we can also um, differentiate, maybe the pre-disaster um, mechanisms that the, the local communities can to, do to adapt. And also the, then there's a post-disaster um, uh, mechanism that we need to think about. And, and in all this, I think what's probably maybe uh, important to ask is, how about the insurance um, um, schemes that's already currently available in Kenya? or is there something we can do more about building local insurance schemes, um, um, private and pu public uh, partnerships that could help um, bring in more insurance mechanisms that's already in place so that we can actually calculate and also um, and make it more legitimate, the losses that, that are being made. Um, and we can document that and also use that as a, as a clear evidence on, on claiming these um, uh, these losses when the, the money and the funding is made available. I hope that was clear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kim, uh, for the wonderful contribution. Yes, the issue about loss and damage, they have taken note of it. And uh, what I was saying, like uh, locally, what Kenya is trying to talk about currently is uh, uh, the issue of like, uh, as we get ready, because financing is still debated, uh, you know, locally, there's a, they talk about, can we start thinking about a framework uh, that fits into what will be agreed upon? And uh, it will be really nice uh, even uh, having a chat, uh, it's called what, a side chat on this, and uh, just look at uh, the possibility of a framework in future for loss and damage. 
and then for insurance scheme, I just want to say like uh, Samburu, for instance, there are people who've, uh, it's under the International Livestock uh, Research uh, Institute, ILRI. So the, the live, livestock-based insurance scheme. So what happens is, uh, you know, traditionally there was the local way the pastoralists were doing some sort of uh, insurance where like uh, there was gifting, there was splitting herds and taking some to different families. And um, one of it was like even the polygamy played a role in terms of uh, the family would split herds uh, to different uh, uh, different family, uh, the same family, but different uh, homestead or different bombers in different parts of uh, the county, uh, country or county. So this was to help that uh, in places where they benefit from uh, lowland grazing, then you'll have the sheep and goat graze. But if that family loses all its stock, then they'll get livestock from the other family that is on the higher land, uh, on the, uh, the higher grounds to, to share with them. And then gifting or uh, the kinship, the thanks, the kinship arrangement was also essential in terms of uh, helping these families. Uh, as a social, it was like a community benefit scheme where if uh, say for instance my blood my brother has lost all his livestock i'll go gift him some he'll come visit or my agent has lost i'll gift him some with a not with a promise but with the principle of uh, reciprocity that um, at some point when i might have uh, when I, I i can lost uh, when mine will be lost to disaster or when something happened then you'll give me back so there was that solidarity and reciprocity, but increasingly, there are those who are who have uh, taken the schemes, the livestock insurance. But the, it's based on again, age. You know, among the pastoralists, age plays a role in terms of age sets and age groups. So the group that is currently active in terms of livestock, or Uh, up to and uh, apart from being educated, they are somehow informed. So this helps uh, in terms of uh, uptake of these schemes. Yeah, so so that is also taken care of. So about pre, post, and uh, maybe during the disaster preparation. Yeah, so so, so we we what we'll consider looking at that and uh, splitting the report to have. Uh, what are the pre-preparation uh, for disaster or uh, pre-adaptation? What happens actually during the actual disasters and uh, post-disaster? How do they either bounce back or what mechanism do they use to survive that period? Uh, thank you, Molo, for the response. Uh, I would want to believe that uh, uh, the question was answered to a satisfa satisfaction, Kim. Uh, I can't seem to see any hands raised up or a question in the chat or uh, someone who will want to share their remarks on the same. So I would want to imagine that the presentation was well presented uh, to the satisfaction of each and every one of, the, of us. Um, I also want to uh, bring the apologies from part of our team. They are not able to join us today due to uh, some commitments elsewhere. But during our next session, they'll be able to join us in the next review that we'll have. Uh, since our director is not here to give us the closing remarks, I will just want to request Molo to give us uh, the last, the next steps uh, with regards to this issue. Can Molo, the next steps or the way forward with regards to this issue? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And uh, what I would want to um, say, one, is uh, for Africa and uh, for developing countries, you know, adaptation might mean adaptation, mitigation, and loss and damage presents an opportunity to do things differently and uh, just to look uh, robustly or holistically at issues. Uh, this is why we are talking about integrated resource management and uh, those kind of principles. So it's it's a way 
the, the challenges at times present opportunity for doing things differently and uh, for getting ahead or uh, what we call lip, uh, lip progging, you know. So this is uh, what climate change and uh, these challenges present to us. Secondly, when it comes to issues like, uh, like now as noted, the uptake of insurance scheme might be an area that will require some sort of uh, either awareness or investments. And uh, it has to be intentional that uh, you're targeting this particular group uh, investments and awareness. But having said that, there's also the issue of uh, policy space. This this whole this whole um, this whole space of climate change adaptation mitigation offers an opportunity in terms of policy space to look really deeper into our policies, whether they are just address a particular problem or they go deeper in terms of being futuristic. But beyond just offering that policy space, it also provides a research opportunity for the people in this particular space. So really, Karin and uh, the network members, we have a lot that we can offer. And uh, I'll just encourage that uh, we continue talking about this. We continue looking actively for solutions and trying to see what works best for this particular area. But the space for local knowledge in terms of co-production we should never ever ignore it. It's going to be really important in the coming decades. And for us to really realize the, some of the principle of locally led adaptation, and um, for us to integrate some of the things that we are saying uh, should be done. If we work within that space of what local knowledge has and uh, kind of package uh, existing technologies, existing knowledge frames to suit the local community, I think we are going to move forward uh, to avoid reaching that point of uh, uh, humanity. Uh, instead of looking at uh, addressing climate change at a session, then we are tackling humanitarian, uh, humanitarian response. There is an opportunity that we work proactively and we get ahead. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you members of uh, Arin team for, and um, guests for being part of this. Uh, thank you so much, Molo, for the presentation and for the closing remarks uh, on the next steps with regards to this issue. Uh, now, as our norm, I would love to request everyone to turn on our video so that our technical team can take uh, a screenshot, a photo of all the members present. Okay, giving us one minute before we can take the photo. Our technical team is on standby. Uh -huh. Okay. On the count of one, two, and three, I believe we are all set. Thank you so much, uh, team, for joining. Be blessed, and let's meet again on fr next Friday for the third session of the review this year. Be blessed. Thank you uh, so much, and uh, uh, for the active listening. See you. Bye.